us. First of all, we have Stefan Lehne, a Western scholar, Carnegie Europe, uh, Austrian, served in the Foreign Ministry, political director. I knew him a very long time and he served with Javier Solana. Stefan's paper, he will explain to you that it's quite depressing because nothing has changed since he wrote the paper, but that's to be part of the discussion. And Stefan will, will comment on his paper. Um, next we have, very pleased, thank you very much Ambassador for coming, Carole von Rentshofer, who's the permanent representative of the, the PSC, the political, uh, the COPS committee here uh, for the Netherlands, the EU Political Security Committee. Uh, uh, the, the Dutch ambassador is very timely given that the Netherlands has the presidency. Thank you very much. It's, it's not, it's, it probably you've been placed into the hot seat. Let's hope, <laughs> let's hope um, it'll, it'll all work out for you. And our third um, speaker is Valentina Pop, EU correspondent for the Wall Street Journal. We go back many, many years when I was based here in Brussels. Nice to see you after such yes, a long time. And just, just for in terms of, of identity, uh, Valentina is Romanian. So we have an Austrian, Romanian and a Dutch and I'm Irish. Oh, Jan is German. <laughs> and there's a very nice mixture of people here from backgrounds and nationalities. Thank you very much for coming. Stefan, I would like you to uh, briefly explain or give, or give an account of the, the main thrust of your paper. Why did you write it in the main thrust of it? <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I'll start, as one should, with a quote by Jean Monnet. Uh, he said, uh, Europe was, will be forged in crisis and will be the sum of solutions adopted in crisis situation. And this has turned into some kind of mantra that uh, the EU always emerges mm. strengthened from mm. crisis. And if that's true, that we have all reasons to rejoice at crisis, so the EU will be tremendously strengthened in the end of it. Well, maybe... Maybe not. Uh, I think there are reasons to believe why this is a different sort mm. of crisis. Mm. If you look back, mostly, most crises have been crises of stagnation. Mm. Uh, an important project got stuck, uh, and then there was a lot of tension and aggravation and discussions, and after some months or sometimes years, some kind of compromise was forged mm. and the EU could move forward. Mm. Uh, this is different. I think for the first time, uh, an important achievement of the integration process, Schengen, is under threat. It's being lost, actually, as we speak. Uh, and that threatens to throw the integration process into reverse. It's not the question of stagnation, it's a question of losing ground, mm. basically. And I was struck by the parallels and also by the differences uh, with the Euro crisis, because like the Euro crisis, Schengen turned out to be, uh, like the Euro, the Schengen turned out to be a fair weather project, a construction mm that is not resilient, that uh, is not uh, able to sustain shocks and c bad crises. But the dynamics are quite different. Uh, in the case of Euro, uh, the failure of the Eurozone, the falling apart of this Eurozone, would have been a massive economic catastrophe for yeah. everyone. And there was tremendous time urgency. In some European Council, you had to have a result before the financial markets opened the next day. So in spite of the mood being basically anti-deepening and mm. no further integration, a lot of, of very significant deepening steps were actually done. Uh, the stability mechanisms, the banking mm. union, etc. Because there was simply no alternative. Mm. Uh, with the migration crisis, the dynamics are different. Uh, obviously, also losing Schengen has a huge economic cost. There uh, mm. was a study by Bertelsmann published this week that over 10 years, the cost would be amount to 470 billion euro, a tremendous amount. But this will come on the, over the long term. Yes. In, in, in the, at the beginning, there is some inconvenience, there is some cost, but everybody can live with that. And the, what needs to be done, the deepening steps are very difficult politically to sell to your population, basically. So uh, this yeah. is a different kind of, 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 of constellation, and therefore it's, 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 it's quite dangerous. I uh, have looked into the reasons why the EU has done mm. so poorly over the past year, and I just very quickly go through Please. some of them. Okay. One is that the... Uh, crisis arrived when the EU was already weakened by the Euro crisis. The crisis has produced divisions, uh, has, I think, reduced the solidarity mm -hmm. uh, among the Definitely. member states. And uh, when this new crisis struck, we were not in good shape. Then there was the crisis, a big problem of leadership. I, I don't think that the leaders of the institutions have established themselves as strong European mm. leaders yet. I was 
actually quite frustrated by the kind of doom and gloom messages that you get constantly from Mr. Tusk and Mr. Juncker, this notion that we are in the same situation as at the beginning of the First World War, that Mr. Tusk said that recently, or Mr. Juncker said the last chance commission and, and a union without union and things like that. That was not a rhetoric that you know, inspired a lot of confidence in, in the ability of solving this problem. Uh, and initially, I think uh, Mrs. Merkel simply continued the leadership role that she had already yeah. developed during the, the Euro crisis. But of course, uh, this was never very popular with the other member states and proved to be unsustainable because of the specific situation in Germany. When it came to the Ukraine, when it came to the Euro crisis, Germany is the biggest and most powerful and the richest state uh, is there to offer solidarity yes. to the others. It's a key partner and can shape policies. In this crisis, Germany was the most the victim, the yes. most affected country, with by far the greatest number of refugees, and therefore it demanded solidarity rather than offering it. Uh, plus, uh, Mrs. Merkel has been accused by some of the other leaders of Europe of creating the burden that she wanted to share. And that, of course, also meant that other countries were not as willing to come along. And that leads me to another main reason why we've done so poorly, and that is the asymmetric impact of the crisis on the member states. For the majority of member states, they have not been affected at all. And those who have been affected have been affected in totally different ways. The countries of first arrival want to overcome the constraints of the Dublin rules. The transit countries want to pass the burden along as quickly as possible uh, and to deviate it to others. And the countries where a final destination uh, want to bring the numbers down and, and to ask for solidarity and burden sharing. And it's hard enough to have solidarity when you face a common challenge, but it's much more difficult if you have completely opposed interests, basically. And that's not just the interests, but also the mentalities, yes. because the globalized societies of Western Europe, uh, for them it's not shocking if you have mm. uh, 10,000 uh, mm. uh, refugees, yes. whereas for the Central European countries that lived in isolation over decades, uh, this is, has a totally different salience and it's much more difficult to accept for the popu population. And then finally, I think this is one of the key reasons why we've done not well enough. I think the strength of the EU is to uh, subject uh, political issues to a uh, technocratic dialogue and mm. you continue as long as it takes until it mm. becomes pretty unclear who wins and who loses mm. and everybody can live with the result. This does not work with an, an issue that is so burning, so salient yes. and so uh, decisive for mm. the outcome of the next elections. And therefore the main crisis management in this crisis, the heads of states and governments, uh, never developed a European approach, a European mm. vision. They all relapsed into a purely national yes. logic. Uh, and it what proved how weak the EU is actually as a public space. The narrative was always fragmented on the national level. There was no common, mm. even common discourse on, on this mm. issue at all. Now, very quickly to my three scenarios. The first scenario is the ever lose a union, mm -hmm. you know, the treaty <laughs> provision with the Cameron fought so hard to get an exception from the ever closer union. And I, if things continue as they're going right now, he need not have bothered basically because we're already in the direction of, of, uh, of basically uh, becoming uh, less and less integrated. Uh, I don't believe that the EU will dissolve like the Soviet Union or, or former Yugoslavia. That is quite unlikely for the, in my mind because there is sufficient mm. strong economic interest that keeps the whole thing going. I think Madame Le Pen even doesn't want to introduce customs on intra-European trade. So there is some kind of resilience there that should not be uh, underestimated. At the same time, I, I think uh, there is a risk that uh, the UK membership in the EU mm. could be part of the collateral damage of the, mm. of the refugee crisis. If the referendum in June takes place against the background of the EU falling apart on mm. the, on the mm. refugee crisis, this could be the decisive factor that, that strengthens the vote in favor mm. of, of Brexit. Uh, but I think what is more likely is that uh, the EU, the, the glue between the mm. member states, the solidarity will mm. 
will get even thinner uh, and, and the, the big projects of the Juncker Commission, mm. for instance, Energy Union, uh -huh. Cyber Market, they will get ah. stuck in this process. I think the quality of the implementation of legislation will possibly decline. I think it's a very bad sign if you have a, a legal uh, instrument, uh, like the relocation decision, yeah. which is simply not implemented. It's devastating, and uh, it, this also leads to sort of spillovers in, in other areas. So I would think that in the longer term, uh, the EU, a bit like, like um, the League of Nations or the Holy Roman Empire, will still be there, and the institutions will be there, etc. but the real music will play elsewhere, mm. coalitions of the willing, other institutional frameworks. Yeah. It will simply become less and less relevant as a, as a framework. The second uh, scenario very quickly is sort of a, a mini Schengen. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said, the losing Schengen is a tremendously costly yes. and counterproductive exercise. I would think if the EU, as on the, in the present framework with 28 Schengen countries and 22 EU members who are part of Schengen, does not get its act together, in my view it is quite likely that over time hmm. there will be a smaller group of countries that say we have to save what has to be saved and we have to move uh, on uh, among ourselves. There was, uh, this was mentioned by some Dutch politicians, I say carefully, it was never a full proposal but it was mentioned sometime in November then quickly hmm. denied and taken back. But uh, I do believe if things do not improve the idea will come back. I think the notion that you, mm. in order to, to participate from the benefits of Schengen, you have to abide by the rules yes. and you have to show solidarity. It's a fairly strong argument and it's sort of inescapable that uh, this will come back if, if the EU as a whole does not get a grip mm. on, the, on the issue. And it's done, it could be done the same way Schengen was created. Basically, the, the, yes. the core could make a treaty among themselves, uh, uh, establish the rules, and possibly also in establish institutions. I believe uh, this would be very divisive in the European Union. There will be a lot of, of uh, fighting back, etc. But I think over time it might stabilize yeah. again. It might huh. actually uh, uh, be just a period where we yeah. have to move towards uh, such a situation. The third option is, of course, uh, the favorite option and at the moment not the most likely one is that full, full Schengen can be revived. Uh, uh, I think Carola's job is basically to explain how this can be done, so I'd be very, very safe. <laughs> uh, I, I would just say that I do think it's not rocket science. Actually, many of the solutions are already, in a way, sketched out in the Commission proposals, mm. ideas, and even some of the decisions that have been taken in 2015. Uh, there is no silver bullet. Mm. I think the notion that one single thing can resolve this problem is, is quite implausible. I yeah. do believe that Mrs. Merkel had put too many of her eggs into the Turkish basket, basically. And I think now more and more people realize that this is just one lever, yeah. but there are many other things yes. that have to be done at the same time to bring this process to a control. I think at the heart there must be some kind of uh, new deal between the countries on the external borders and the countries of final destination. And it must be based on regaining control over the external borders mm. through national efforts, but also through this new uh, uh, frontier uh, guard that mm. the Commission has proposed. Uh, mm. And then there must be some kind of burden sharing mechanism. I think in mm. the longer term, it's for me quite unthinkable that without some kind of yeah. burden sharing of, of refugees, uh, financial, but also uh, relocation mechanism, yes you can have a sustainable yeah. solution in, 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 in the longer term. Yeah. But you do have to do many things too. I think this idea of bringing the refugees from the third countries directly in a legal way to the EU is also an extremely plausible outcome. Stefan, thank you it for- It was too long, I'm sorry. No, 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 it, it was needed actually to put all these complex issues into perspective. Um, the, the, just, uh, just to remind everybody, League of Nations collapsed and so did the Holy Roman Empire. Hope the EU doesn't go the same way. Uh, one point on your mini Schengen, maybe, maybe it is a much smaller version of, um, of a, a, a smaller, a smaller, closer union, a much tighter one. Maybe Schäuble might take some, some um, might, might believe this might, might be a good idea. Um, 
but since we have uh, many of the Central Europeans here, they can no doubt explain why they won't implement. Uh, Valentino, would you like to, would you want to pick up on what yeah, Stefan was saying? Yes. I would like to, to pick up on his points, especially uh, why I, I see some problems with the mini Schengen, and I guess this is also why it was dropped, is because um, who will be in that? group is it do you include france or don't you include france is Aust austria right now has some issues exactly. with everybody exactly. else so, um th that's why the the uh, first point of the ever looser you know where you would have all sorts of alliances yes. of convenience now and then um, is is actually a much more plausible uh scenario than the one where you have a defined core of countries that absolutely want to do more integration because at this point it's hard to see who else, apart from perhaps Belgium and, and Luxembourg, but not even them, uh, really want, I mean, this was evident in the Brexit discussions, that the countries who really insisted on uh, ever closer yes. union, um, apart from the European Parliament. There were very few, um, is my point. Um, but what is sort of happening, is that I, I think, see it now as a revival of Magrit and surrealism. This is what is happening in the European discourse. We've seen it over and over again in the UK a debate. Um, so presenting things that apparently are contradictory as being one. And now the mantra increasingly among EU officials seems to be, well, wait a minute, these national solutions are part of the European solution. And um, mm -hmm. if countries do their own thing, well, let's just make sure that they are included or that they talk to each other, but there is no more grand EU plan. There is rather a, a manage, uh, an attempt to manage the various national plans and even to, to do contingency planning for something that last year was seen as a thing to avoid most, is a humanitarian crisis, uh, refugee crisis on EU soil. This is what everybody was avoiding last year, and now it seems to be the case that people think, oh, this will actually happen in Greece, let's make sure Greece gets all the money needed to, or, mm. and then the help to cope with this because it's inevitable. So how did we get there mm. and, and what, where are we going from here is, is what I would like, I don't yes. know, <laughs> to, uh, to, Thank, to discuss. Thanks for that, Valentin. Yeah. It goes very nicely into uh, what uh, the whole implementation issue. Just one point, the national plans that you speak of, in fact, these are rather negative plans. Oh, yeah. I mean, they aren't plans, yeah. they, are, they are actually plans of resistance. And, yeah. Plans of resistance. And um, it's all very well talking about the, 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 the nations, the country should have a say, but it's, it's, not, it's, it's not an input. The implementation has always been the issue in the, since the beginning of this crisis, Carola. So, <laughs> now we can stop. <laughs> but, I mean, if, if, when you, when you actually, when you mentioned Stefan burden sharing or, or relocation, but how on earth is this going to be implemented given the present atmosphere among the 28 countries? Now, I, I agree with you, implementation is an issue. I'm one of those infamous bureaucrats uh, who are behind the scene working on, on as you said, um, technocratic solutions, but, but we do that definitely with the real world first on our minds. And if, if I got to choose between the three scenarios, ever looser, um, a hardcore, or a joint way forward, clearly I would choose for the joint way forward. And that's also what, what the Netherlands, uh, as a presidency of the Council of the European Union, together with others, is now really working on to get that done and to get it implemented. Um, and it's definitely, it's a big challenge. It's, it's one of the bigger challenges we have faced since the European Union was founded. Um, but I'm still confident that if we want to, we will manage, uh, and we definitely want to. Um, the European Councils of, of last week in December, they really clearly set the strategic direction um, of where to go. And yes, it is a set of measures, um, but it's not uh, a set of national measures. It's a set of, of different blocks that we work on internally within the EU, <coughs> and externally beyond our borders. And that's the only way to go at it. We need an, an, an integrated approach to this crisis. It's a very complex crisis and there's no simple solution to a complex crisis. It has a complex solution, uh, 
based on, on a, a number of building blocks, but that build together a house, hopefully. And now in the coming weeks, decisive steps, implementation, that's where we, where we are now and what we really need, need to work on. Um, of course, we need to do it with all 28 and all in Schengen. Everybody has to be transparent, communicate what it says and, and respect his legal obligations. Um, more concretely, we have a legislative agenda, um, working on a list of safe countries of origin, making sure we move forward quickly as soon as we can with the proposals on a European coast and border guard, um, and also review the Dublin uh, rules, that is the, the Schengen uh, package, review that so that it, it continues to work. And then on top of that, we have to work on, on, on the ring around the EU. Um, it's mentioned um, not often enough when we talk about migration, but it all starts, of course, with finding a solution um, for the Syria crisis. Yes. Um, we always mention we have to address the root causes, and this is, of course, yeah, the most important absolutely. root cause. So I'm really hoping that um, under the, the, the lead of, of Stefan de Mistura, who is the UN envoy, uh, we can finally move forward in, in this crisis for a, a plethora of reasons we have to solve it, but one of yes. them is to, to cope with the migration crisis and the refugee crisis in Europe. Um, then, of course, we have to work with the countries that are hosting many refugees, work with Lebanon and Jordan. Their burden is much bigger than the burden yeah. on the EU. Uh, they have per capita huge numbers of refugees and we have to yeah. help them host them. Uh, we're working on what we call compacts, another bureaucratic term, um, but it's a package of measures integrated helping the countries with work, with investments, uh, with uh, capacities to host refugees, etc. cetera. Um, at the same time, we have to fight the smuggling and the tra trafficking. It's the cynical group of people that, that profits from the crisis and we have to work um, with the EU and the countries that are coping with this problem to, to really fight the traffickers and the smugglers. Um, follow up on the Valletta summit, it, it's, a, it's not so long ago, but we had a big summit in November on Malta with Africa, and there we are, it, it's, it's now a bit out of the media, but we are implementing what we agreed. Um, we are working um, on, on partnerships, on addressing the root causes of migration there, which are often more economic than yes. political. Um, and then, of course, there is Turkey. Um, we have an action plan agreed towards the end of last year. Here also, it's the, 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 the thing we're working on is to, to make it work, and as a presidency, we're in very close contact with Turkey, and in March, we will have uh, a summit meeting with Turkey uh, to, to take steps forward. <laughs> then I would want to mention Greece mm. again um, as a country that has a, a huge burden on its, uh, its plate. And frankly, it's my opinion, no single country could cope with right. such a challenge on its own. So Turkey needs, uh, Greece needs our help with setting up the hotspots where you register uh, refugees and <coughs> migrants, uh, with its border management, um, and with delivering assistance to migrants. And this also means that other European countries have to deliver on the commitments they made to make people available for Frontex, for example, um, and to do this relocation uh, that we agreed on last year to get migrants from Greece and from Italy into other European countries, and all have to do that. Um, just a bit of promotion of my own country. Uh, the Netherlands has a, um, a border security team on Chios, directly assisting um, Greece on a place where they have a lot of migrants coming in and helping them to, to register everyone. Last point, the Balkans. Mm -hmm. um, there is a, a, a transit flow through the Balkans and, and we have to assist these countries um, in managing this in an orderly fashion and we don't believe in, in patchwork solutions or in a, in a race to the bottom where unilateral measures prevail because, as you said, that, that will not work. Um, it will increase tensions and it will also um, make the situation worse for the refugees and the migrants. Yeah. Because you get stuck everywhere. It, it, it's, it's horrible, I think, if you're there with your family. Um, so we have to help the countries in the Balkans to register and to, to do it properly. Well, this is, this is the agenda we have, the, the package of measures we have that, that, that builds up to a, a sound whole of it. Uh, the challenge is to implement it properly with all concerned. 
and only in this integrated fashion where we, we play on the internal and the external feed simultaneously, I hope we will be able to cope with it. Well, thank you very much for, for giving us a tiny, tiny little bit of optimism about the possibility of implementation. I'm actually very pessimistic about this. Uh, before I ask Stefan or Valentino to come in, I, I find that the whole problem of the refugees is that uh, from the perception of those countries that won't welcome them, they are regarded as objects. This is an extraordinary humanitarian crisis. These are about people who have been tortured, who are fleeing, who cannot go back to their homes. They don't have any more homes to go to. It's truly shocking dimension. And that, um, when I think, Stefan, you mentioned the Jean Monnet, uh, the process. But you can, can you really reconcile a process to this extraordinary humanitarian crisis that is not going to go away? And all the more need for a, a burden sharing and for every country in the EU to recognize that these are people who are seriously fleeing war. They're not, they, they don't want to, to, to flee their homes, but they have no choice. And I was wondering, is this whole, I, this technocratic process idea, which is embedded in, in the original European community, does it really have any credence now? Well, I, I think you have to differentiate between the short term and the longer term perspective. In the short term, it's pretty evident to me that if the refugee flows continues mm -hmm. on the same level of, as 2015, the EU is done with, mm -hmm. basically, because it's politically not sustainable. Uh, of course, we can take another million and two million, but the political systems will not survive it. Mm -hmm. what, what the EU, uh, the refugee crisis is driving the polarization uh, in the member states, basically. Mm. The, the mainstream parties are losing ground. The populists, mostly on the right, but sometimes also to the left, are gaining ground. The EU <laughs> it depends on a coalition between centre-left and centre-right for, for decades, basically. What these groups at the mm. margins have in common, they both hate the EU. Yes. Uh, and the mainstream parties sometimes, uh, and this unfortunately happens in my countries, are co-opting the policies, some of the policies of the populist right, because they are getting so frightened. That therefore, they become more and more restrictive. So for me, it's unfortunately quite clear, is the inflow on that level and mm. the notion this, the, that it is out of control, basically, it's happening, it's frightening people so yeah. much that that this is uh, creating something that is not sustainable at all. Mm. So I think the key objective for the next few months is to bring the numbers down, but in a humanitarianly acceptable way, which means that you have to make sure that in the countries that are bordering Syria, uh, conditions are such that these people can actually stay for a while. But in the longer term, and, and there I, I, really, uh, I, I really believe you need significant further integration yeah. of this area because uh, the African population will double yes. up to the year 2050. Uh, there is a lot of uh, vulnerability in a number of countries. Yes. There will be big flows coming. Yes. Afghanistan is, is getting weaker and weaker as a state. More people will be coming. So there's no question that uh, Europe will yeah. be confronted with yeah millions of yes. people trying to come in, mm. they will come in. It's yes. totally inevitable. Mm. Europe cannot become a border. But whether this process happens in a controlled and mm. managed way, mm -hmm. based on, on collective uh, approaches and, uh, and uh, legal uh, ways, or whether it happens in a chaotic manner, which basically destroys the kind of political structures we have established on the national level and on a European continental level over decades, that is the question, mm -hmm. basically, that will determine the future of the EU but, but this, and Europe. As such. But this long-term uh, issue you mentioned is all the more reason that there now should be a drive for a collective effort to deal with this long-term scenario, and it's yes, not there. Yes, but to but, get the numbers down, yes. I think, must be the top priority. Okay, well, that goes back to the Syrian war. Valentino, you want to come here? What um, the change in this course is compared to last year, when indeed everybody was focusing on um, the, these are refugees, these are people we need. And I think now a lot of people are looking, yes, but the route is also being used by people who are economic migrants who are not coming from Syria or Iraq, who are coming from mm -hmm. Morocco and Algeria. And there is this vision that if the route is blocked, if only Syrians have a chance, or and Iraqis have a chance to go further or be relocated and so on, it will also create a deterrent effect 
to the other uh, nationalities from coming because right now it's pretty easy in 10 days to two weeks yeah. to go from Turkey to Germany and if this is being um, hampered and, and blocked even though it will create a horrible mess in, in Greece the logic is yes but after a few months people will realize oh, there's no point in coming to Greece in the first place which is quite cynical it, it, yes it is but uh, there's another issue of when Merkel said we'll keep we'll open the doors to Syrians well if you visit Jordan and if you visit Lebanon you understand the huge yeah. price to pay for a Syrian passport but that's another issue people exploiting what was a human humanitarian decision by by Merkel but I want to I want to go back to this issue uh, uh, Carol of what what happens if if uh, Turkey cannot deliver? Well, I think we're on a, on a very clear path with Turkey um, where we agreed um, a number of steps between the EU and Turkey to take. And we're on a good path of, of, of um, taking steps to implement them, like um, increasing the capacities in Turkey to host refugees, increasing the possibilities for them to work they're um, working on the Turkish visa policy, um, having cooperation with Turkey in the field of fighting, smuggling and trafficking. So I am confident, and we will talk again at the highest level to Turkey in March, I'm confident we will be able to make significant steps uh, with Turkey in this field. Um, <laughs> yes, how, how come <laughs> you're confident? Well, because we've come a long way and we have agreed um, I think a good set of steps to take together mm. and um, why would we not, uh, why would we question our power, our joint power together to, to take those steps? Is it really on Turkey's mind to help us? No matter what we promise them, mm. they seem to be overwhelmed with so many other Precisely. problems. The Kurds issue, the war with R Russia, Russia. <laughs> what's happening in Syria. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think you should, should ask the Turks, Turkey what's, yeah, what's on their mind, but, but so far I have no counterindications that there is bad will. Absolutely not. Uh, Stefan, do you want to come in? Well, I, I think it's, uh, the question is uh, the will and the capacity. The problem is uh, Turkey is uh, having a, a war situation basically in the Kurdish areas. It has almost a war situation with Russia, high tensions. It has a difficult economic situation that is declining is a question sort of, of the bandwidth of the Turkish leadership with the complicated internal situation, whether they can sufficiently focus on these yes. issues to produce solutions in the short term. But I think there is no alternative but to try to do this. And there is also the question what, what we underestimate and which is so evident with Turkey is the question also of prestige, mm. self-worth, a sense of humiliation that's a tremendous chip on the shoulders of the leaders uh, leading, leading uh, Turkish um, politicians who feel that they've been discriminated against by the EU for decades and so yes. and on the other hand on the European side you have a lack of trust in Turkey's ability to uh, deliver so also in terms of psychological on yes. the psychological dimension it is very yeah. very difficult to handle I'm going to open the, the uh, open uh, open the floor to lots of questions. Just one thing about Turkey. Uh, frankly, yes, Turkey can do more to protect the external border, but outsourcing the problem to Turkey lets off the hook an awful lot of EU member states, actually. Uh, that's only a comment. Um, so I'm going to open out the floor. This is uh, the, I'm going to take three, three questions at a time. Identify yourself on one question only. You'll have a second chance later on. And I'm going to take three questions first. One, two, um, and three, okay, please. And if you want to direct your question at any of the panelists, thank you. Thank you. you. Um, Christophe Christian's British Embassy, but I speak in a personal capacity. Um, regarding the discussion on Mini Schengen, with the, let's call it an ultimatum to the Greek government, and also with some of the actions from the Austrian government to push people back into Slovenia, hasn't that already happened? Isn't that already started? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, please, a microphone here, please. If you could pass down the microphone. Thank you. Mohamed Rajai Barakat, 
uh, former economic expert in some Arab embassies. Uh, what are, if because of uh, refugee crisis, we don't have Schengen, uh, do you have an idea about the economic costs okay. for the European, mm -hmm. for European uh, okay. Union member states? Hi. And another uh -huh. one short question. No, this one. no. <coughs> you, you don't worry, you can come back, promise. Mm -hmm. Thank you, I hope you understand because it's a packed audience. Thank you very much, Francis yeah. Wabadia from the Bruegel Institute. Um, one explicit premise of your statement, and I think implicit in what the, the other two panelists uh, said, is that um, these people are a burden. Uh, is that so? Uh, is that so at least over the medium to, to, to long term uh, horizon? Yes. Are they not also a resource mm -hmm. if we are able to integrate them? I mean, you know, I mean, Europe is getting older and older. The demographics is terrible. Yeah. Is uh, that not something to, uh, yes. to, to put into the picture? And two important questions, the burden, the integration issue, the economic costs, very important, and the mini, mini Schengen, does it already exist? Um, Carol, uh, would you like to take up any of these ones? Well, yes, maybe. I, I will take the first question on, on the mini, mini Schengen, Schengen because you're, you already mentioned mm -hmm. that um, this was linked to, to, to Dutch politicians as well. Um, what we are working on is to keep Schengen afloat um, with all its current member states. Um, and we feel that that's what we have to, to focus our work on mm -hmm. um, because that will be the, uh, the best way to, to go about confronting this challenge. And coming back a bit to, to, to what you also said in the introduction, the whole core of the EU is about confronting challenges together. Um, and that I hope uh, we can keep in mind also going through this rather challenging issue uh, this year. So I would say we focus on, 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 on a full Schengen. Um, mm. And the coming weeks, um, as I think you indicated, sir, are also um, critical weeks to, to show that it's still uh, working, that it's still mm. um, effective. Um, and of course, the, the, the legal agenda we have um, with uh, um, the Border and Coast Guard package and with reviewing the Dublin regulations mm. will help us mm. to, to move forward with the whole group. All right. I hope you're right on this. Um, we've got the, 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 the burden issue and the economic costs. Um, the economic, uh, you, yeah. you mentioned yeah. the Bertelsmann study. Well, uh, uh, the, the yeah. last study is by Bertelsmann, and I've, uh, it has this tremendous figure of 470 billion over 10 years. There was an earlier study by a French yes. uh, think tank. It spoke about, I think, 7 billion a year. So nobody knows precisely, but everybody knows it's hugely costly. Yes. No, no, for no, the no, EU. for the EU as, as for such. The, but but, the, uh, but uh, this is also a very important point that you made. That of course uh, most economists uh, believe that uh, a considerable amount of immigration is absolutely necessary for the EU to regain its uh, economic uh, growth and and also to to pay the the welfare systems uh, in the longer term. Uh, there's no question. That I think in, in Germany there have been calculations that they need theoretically 400,000 people a year to maintain the balance between the working and the non-working population, a huge amount of money. But of course that presupposes, and I agree with this absolutely, this is, uh, the migrants have lots to offer and, and uh, they should be seen not as just as a burden but also a resource. But what it, uh, it depends on whether they turn into a burden or a resource, whether they are successfully integrated. Yeah, exactly. And there the access to the the market, of the job market, is, is absolutely key and fundamental. I've seen figures from Scandinavia that it takes seven years for, yeah. for yeah. refugees on average to enter the job market. Yeah. Uh, and that is a very long time. And if uh, millions arrive every year, mm -hmm. then you have the risk that this is not handled correctly. And what absolutely. we see at the moment in Austria and Germany is there are lots of people sitting in camps and doing nothing yes. for months and months yeah. and months. Yeah. And that is not improving their ability to contribute to, to society. Yeah. So the question is, if it's too much and too suddenly, then you create parallel societies. Exactly. Uh, lots of people of, of very frustrated and angry individuals who are 
who are, will be a burden in the longer term. So the question is, uh, it has to be handled in the right way. What is interesting is, of course, that <laughs> Europe is the continent that has seen the greatest outward migration, I think, from any continent in the world. And I think between <laughs> the year 1880 and 1910, uh, about 30 million Europeans have moved to the United States. So we are mm -hmm. now on the receiving end. <laughs> For a long time, we were on the sending end. And, and of course, uh, the United States mm. is structurally in society the more capable of mm. absorbing uh, immigration than we are. It's an important point, and we have some, I'd like to hear your views if you, uh, you beside the Bruegel, our Bruegel colleague. I mean, one forgets that Germany took in over 12 million after World War II, mm. and of course, the economic uh, rebirth. <laughs> yes, there was, well, some couldn't, I mean, there's still a huge uh, Polish speaking mm -hmm. um, uh, of German backgrounds. They mm -hmm. still speak Polish mm -hmm. in, 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 uh, rest, in the western parts of Germany. And of course, many did go back, but many stayed from the former Yugoslavia. And they did integrate. There's been success stories in Germany Austria and in Sweden too. and in Austria as well. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, Valentina, I, sorry I for keeping you waiting. I just wanted to say that indeed it, it's, it's a tremendous. Um, addition and and it's it's a plus for for the society but again it, the the shock of um, arrival can be tremendous and and, and just not ca the capacities of a country can can be totally overwhelmed like it happened in sweden so when sweden decided to put up border controls and to basically refuse people from coming in was when they had over three months one of the their interior minister said that they had so many um, unaccompanied minors yes, and exactly. and families with children arriving that they would have had to set up a thousand classrooms every week and that's just not feasible they they can't do that and of course then we come back to the issue of, of sharing the burden equally but then what if these people don't want to go to some other yeah. corners of Europe you yes, can't also exactly. force them to do that either so it's a bit of a catch twenty. Well, this is this is experience for the Czech. My Czech friends tell me um, that when refugees, when they did accept refugees in Prague, for instance, as soon as they could, the refugees wanted to go to their own their own diaspora in other, mostly Germany, but yes. also they tried to get to England as well. So it's it's very very complex now. Well, another set of questions. Um, uh, ooh, one, two. Ooh, actually, I've got to be fair. One, two, three, please. Yeah, introduce yourself in one question. Thank you. My name is Ida Stechnitz. I'm from Norway, if I may. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to have comments uh, from the panel on the issue which concerns me a lot. Why have we actually ended up in a situation where there seems to be so much lack of trust in European institutions? We see uh, that national interests prevail when many of the member states prefer not to send their resources or channel their resources and people through European uh, um, European um, instruments, but actually uh, nationally uh, think that it is a better solution to yeah. staff borders and build fences uh, or deal with uh, the situation at hand without going through Brussels. Yeah. Why have we ended up in this, yeah. where uh, many of these countries that actually are of that opinion are those that have profited maybe the most, mm. both in terms of economic growth and assistance for transformation. From exactly. Brussels. Thank you very much. Uh, please, the gentleman with here. Yeah, my name is Mikhail Dolan. I'm Carnegie Easy Herford Fellow from Armenia. And being from Armenia, I want to raise the issue of the Eastern Partnership. I mean, part of the Eastern Partnership uh, program was about visa first facilitation, then liberalization. And, you know, eventually the countries of Eastern Partnership were supposed to become part of the larger European yeah. space, at least in terms of people's free movement. So does the whole uh, refugee crisis uh -huh. mean mm. that, you know, we have to forget about this perspective, at least okay. in the short term perspective? Uh, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned perspective if they ever had one. But thank <laughs> you. Uh, no, you know, this gentleman here it was over here. And then we go on to if that's OK. I, I haven't put you on the uh, list. Thank you. My name is Mark Benching. I'm a former Dutch diplomat. Um, I'd like to um, recall one dimension which I think has been absent from our discussion until now. That's the, the dimension of identity, um, because uh, I believe that uh, the core is basically, it's about identity. We 
we live in the age of identity politics. And it seems to me that we must uh, bite that bullet somehow um, at the national level and at the EU level. And only then will the technocratic approach, which is mm. necessary, uh, fall into place and become less impotent as it mm. is now. Uh, thank you. Can I, I, want, I, I don't want to, I want to, what do you mean by identity? Who we are. Okay, fine. As Europeans or rather than as, as, a, as, a, as a collection of nation states? I just, in order to frame oh, the question. Christian, Muslim, oh, I see, cultural identity. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to make sure I understood. Thank, thank you. I wanted to make sure I understood the context of the question. Okay, we have three uh, Eastern Partnership perspective. I hope this, we'll see what happens with the, with the answers. The identity, uh, clearly the cultural identity we're talking about, and the, um, oh, the, yes, well, the trust in the European solution. Three very easy questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Valentina, yeah. I think you go first this time. T oh, you can tick, take I, I one which you would like. I want to take the trust in the European solution. I think there was a bit of a miscalculation last year in the first place. Um, of course, when you look at the Eastern and Central European states, you say, well, you've benefited from all these structural funds. Why don't you uh, take in mm. refugees? Um, I think they were willing to take in refugees as long as this wasn't seen as some cooked up solution in Brussels where you have some mathematical formula that divides up people and say, now you need to take 361 and you need to take this and that. That was, that, that was when the whole thing bro broke apart and this was a strategic mistake from the, from the European Commission, I think, that it didn't go into including them more or, or getting some, some understanding of, of how they would mm. um, um, get on board and just by bullying them they will just dig their heels even even further so we are on this collision course i think what the dutch presidency is trying to do and then the the new concept of well building blocks and if you're better at border management why don't you focus on border management mm. and other people are better at negotiating with turkey let's do that and others maybe are willing to take in right now more refugees and mm -hmm to preserve at least the see. appearance of, of a union. Mm. So kind of clusters of different yeah. interests. Mm -hmm. uh, Carla, how does that sound? Yes. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Let's no, it, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear you to refer to, to the work being done in blocks and being one package. Mm -hmm. um, I think I have to agree with you that, that we all see how the, the trust among the general public in finding European solutions to the crisis has eroded over the past years. Um, I, I don't want to go into the why, uh, that, that, that's too political maybe for me to comment on. But what I, 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 I would like to, to comment is that um, this is a chance for us to regain that trust and to do it right. Um, and, and one of the ways to do that is to, to deliver on, on the demands of the, the population, which is to manage this issue properly um, for all, both, I think, European citizens and um, the, the, the refugees and the migrants. If I can answer yes, the question of course, on, the, uh, the, on uh, the Eastern, Eastern Partnership. Yes, please. Um, Eastern Partnership, you all know, is a partnership between the European Union and six countries to our east. And one, it, it's a whole, again, it's a whole package of measures, but one of the important elements is to, to work on visa liberalization. <laughs> and I don't think um, the work on that is suffering from the current crisis. Um, the countries concerned have to take steps uh, to be ready to have visa-free travel with the European Union. The Commission is closely following that and will come up with proposals as soon as the countries concerned are ready to take the next steps. And um, from what I see in my daily work, this work is progressing at, at the speed that it, that it has to take, depending on the progress the countries concerned make. And, and well, these six countries are not uh, deeply into the, the migration and refugee crisis, so uh, we, we will just continue work on that, and I think you can be confident that it will not suffer from this. Thank you. I want to uh, deal with the identity question. Stefan, yes, yes. Uh, I think the Eurobarometer uh, results are always that very few people have a sense of a European identity. Uh, it's a small minority, and I think 90% have a strong national identity. Uh, that's not a surprise. It took hundreds of years to develop a German identity, uh, even more longer to take an Italian identity, etc. So you can't expect this process to happen in 70 years of European integration. 
the, the problem that we have at the moment is that because of globalization, uh, I, the, the kind of sense of uncertainty, the mm. sense of threat uh, reinforces the national identity. I think we have, and, and the refugee crisis is really that hits you at the very core of your national identity. Mm. Lots of foreign looking mm. uh, people with different religion moving in. And therefore, I think it is so difficult to handle it mm. on the EU level and why it is so natural for each politician to look at it in terms of yes. domestic politics, basically. Mm. Uh, his survival depends on the fact that the, uh, the Germans can live with it. And the EU has never really involved into a, a, a public political space. Uh, so uh, in a crisis situation, we all relapse into a national context. It's almost inevitable. This, this is good. this is a, a much further debate. Another set of questions. Right now, I want to get them all. One, uh, Carol Ivanje. Uh, can can I come back to you? One second. One second. Yeah, it's, uh, okay, have your turn. Yeah. Wait, no, it's, it's a short. One, one, two, three, and the lady there with the glasses over there. And there will be another round. Don't worry. Please identify yourself. Uh, one uh, question. Uh, my name is Hanfors. I worked in the Council Secretariat uh, right. of the European Union, and I was involved in the Dublin Convention already in 891. Oh. And it, it struck me already by that time that there was hardly any question about burden sharing. Now my, right. my point is that uh, I think what has to be done now at this moment especially is that uh, <coughs> refugees, they want to come to Sweden or to England or to Austria, Germany, uh -huh. that is need for common asylum procedures, okay. that yes. they don't last too long, as well as uh, yes. reception conditions yes. and integration. If, th yes. if this, this doesn't take place, they will go still to the same places. Absolutely. And and the my last remark is for the Dutch presidency. I hope that the Ukraine referendum will go <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. Because so that, that is an explosive <laughs> yes. under Absolutely. the Dutch presidency. Thank you very so much for bringing in Ukraine. Sh uh, uh, short question, because yeah. you've already had a question. Yes, please. Uh, I would like to, because you spoke about you know, people who are coming from Algeria and Morocco. Uh, you know, uh, the control of uh, borders is very difficult. Yes. Even if you have a lot of controls, uh, you, you will have many people who yes. are coming and they will, nobody will know from where they, they come. If you go to Chaussée de Mons here, you can find many illegals yes. and uh, you, can't, you can't control. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much for this. Well, all the more reason for proper context. Uh, gentleman back there, I think. Uh, if I. Well, thank you very much, Karo Banai, um, former Hungarian PSC ambassador. I, I'm not working uh, for the government anymore. Uh, don't be afraid of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the distinguished ambassador said at the beginning of her statement uh, that uh, if there is a will, there is a way. My question is, um, how can we create that com common mm. will? Mm. What carrot or carrots and sticks mm. do we have? Do we need carrot or stick? Um, I, I believe that uh, this uh, excellent piece of uh, document which uh, Stefan has uh, prepared is a carrot. Uh, I mean, there is a... I meant it as a stick. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but some believe in our region that that's a stick. Exactly. I see. Well, we may go back to the stick issue. Thank you very much, Karen. And the lady back there, no, no, we'll have another round later. Uh, the lady back there, has, we have to an get, the, get them answered as well. Yes, identify yourself in one question, please. Uh, hi, my name is Evelina. I'm a journalist working for DevEx. Um, I would like to concentrate a little bit about what you already said before, uh, the integration of refugees okay. in the countries uh, within the European Union. Mm -hmm. Is it up only up to the governments to actually try to integrate them, like you, Stefan, said before, seven years in, in Scandinavia? Or should we more a little bit uh, put pressure on the European Union and international organizations and uh, NGOs uh, in order to integrate them yeah. better and faster? Yeah, that's a very important question. We can go, um, so four, four questions, integration of the refugees, very important. Um, will, our, will our way, as Carol Ibanya asks, um, Border controls, uh, very, uh, you've asked it now, and the common asylum procedure. Um, we, we try to rush, we we'll try to speed up this because there's many, many questions out there. Uh, Stefan, which one do you, would you like? Uh, or none? Well, maybe the question of, of ca uh, carrots and sticks. I, I do think, you know, the problem at the moment, I, I do think in the longer term, you need a burden sharing mechanism in which each, every country that benefits from sharing has to share. This, we are not there at the moment, uh, and I think the Visegrad countries 
take very strong positions, basically, that they are not willing to do. I personally think that it will be a combination of, of, of carrots and sticks. I, I think this notion, the risk of, of a mini Schengen eventually emerging, if this cannot be handled in a, in a mm. longer term, is probably the strongest incentive for these countries to come on board. Uh, it has, it's handle, has to be handled in a correct way, uh, in a diplomatic way. But I think ultimately, for me, it's inconceivable that the burden uh, rests with quite a few countries, and uh, whereas every uh, other country continues to benefit, to benefit from, the, from the system. I think this mm. uh, basic unfairness has to be removed. Yes, and the fact that, you, oh, thanks, Stefan, the fact that you mentioned the lack of a common asylum policy just it just confirms yeah, yeah. Stefan's paper, yeah, yeah. actually, yeah. unfortunately. Uh, we have the issue of integration, which is very important, and it's quite clear the, the borders yeah, are very difficult. Yeah, yeah okay. And the integration, um, uh, the role of NGOs. <laughs> I have my own views of integration, please, I'm the moderator. <laughs> <laughs> Valentino, would you like to? Um, well, <laughs> where to begin? Um, I think. First of all, for Germany, what happened um, over the New Year's is exactly the Cologne incidents were exactly what shouldn't ever have happened. And for Ms. Merkel's policy of accepting and looking in the long term, looking at exactly at what well, we can integrate these people and they will be helpful for our economy, we need workforce and so on, um, well, was a stark reminder of, of what difficulties lie ahead in terms of cultural clash? Well, yes, but unfortunately the Cologne events have been equated with the refugees coming from Iraq and Syria. Right. And those, uh, the women that were assaulted, no, they, they, no, they were, they were no. assaulted by North Africa. That's, that's a, a, a story of, of, of the authorities turning a blind eye to what yeah. had been happening at Cologne yeah. over, the, over, the, over, over seven years. I think the issue of in, integration, I think you're getting at something different actually. Yeah. I think they're doing a lot I in think they're Germany. Doing, it's extraordinary. I, I live in Berlin and I, I cannot tell you, really, I cannot enumerate the number of it, thousands of voluntary organizations and individuals helping every single day. And thankfully, the state is out of the way. I mean, they're teaching them German, they're bringing them to the dentist, they're interpreting, they're translating. There, um, and the schools, uh, of course, under the under the aegis of the of the various city authorities, are taking in children and making big efforts to integrate. It's going to be a very long term policy because Europe is very bad at integrating. And whether or not you bring in another bureaucratic level of NGOs and others, we don't want a competition between NGOs either. But we need a, what is needed is a clear long term policy of integration. Next round of questions. Uh, oh, uh, there was one back there. I'm sorry. I went back to one, uh, two. Uh, three, uh, four, actually, oh yeah, I'm sorry, I forgot you, four, uh, and you're on the list. We'll take four short questions, name, yeah. your, your Thank name, Thank you very please. much. My name is Zoltan Nagy. I'm the current Hungarian ambassador to Belgium, the oh. bilateral ambassador. No so I do work for the government, but <laughs> don't be afraid anyway. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> shy Yeah, a very simple question. Uh, how do you see the relationship between uh, the uh, public opinion's view on the migration crisis, uh, the um, overwhelming uh, view in the press, Mm -hmm. uh, and what uh, our political elites are representing. So how do you think the okay. sync between okay. these three? Thank you very much. Okay, with our first question. Now, the second question was um, over here, please. The third question is there and the fourth question is there, right? My name is Christina Nord from the Goethe Institute here in Brussels. And I do have a question because you were talking about the polarization. And I had the feeling that uh, your only measure against polar polarization was um, to reduce the influx of refugees. <coughs> I was wondering if there were more um, options to uh -huh. reduce polarization in the uh -huh. societies. That's a really interesting question. And uh, please. Hi, my name is Ursula Young. Um, I'm actually in training at the European Commission, but I also am a language teacher at this as well, <laughs> in addition to that. So my question is basically, um, do you think we need, um, uh, I mean, do you think policy in the end is what we need, a European, a common European policy, or do you think we can do everything? Um, because we actually organized an event uh, two days ago on this exact topic, and we heard 
good success stories of Dutch mayors integrating refugees, of um, a Slovenian yeah. mayor um, who is himself of, of African origin who, who did a great job as well. And so on a local level, um, there are communities that are doing very much. And um, mm. what, what are your opinions? Do you think we need um, mm. a common European policy, national policy, or are local governments um, in each country, is this enough to, um, to deal with this? Thanks, Jack. A common country. European policy, on, uh, to deal with what specifically? Um, I mean, basically, one rule for which would apply to all member states. One rule in terms um, of, um, of uh, how, how, how much, uh, sharing out the refugees? Yes. Um, well, I mean, burden sharing. Burden and sharing. Okay. And I also, just okay. Um, um, ba I mean, basically, my, my point of view is, um, so uh, what uh, is the best solution? Okay. The best solution yes. to the refugee okay. crisis, is okay. it A, okay. European level policy, B, national, national level policy, or C, okay. local communities, NGOs, okay. which she was mentioning earlier Super. as well. Okay. So that's okay. Thank you very much. And the gentleman has been very patient. Yes, you. This gentleman here on the front as well. Yeah. Thank you. Alexandre Bedok from the European News Forum. Uh, I listened carefully about what Carola said at the, at the beginning, and I really believe that there's lots being done right now to address the crisis and also uh, the multiplication of all the summits, but there is one question that strikes me, is that why so late? Is there nothing that we could have anticipated? I mean, we, we have many signs. Yeah. The, the premises of the Syrian war is not from yesterday. Mm. We have seen Turkey and Lebanon taking a lot and a lot of refugees. Yeah. So are we not, like, is not really yeah. late and does it not show lack of political yeah. willingness? Yeah. I, um, thank you very much. Uh, uh, we were discussing this just before we assembled here. You know, the writing was on the wall two, three years ago. Uh, just, just repeat the forecast. Out of zinc, um, how to reduce the polarization, very, very important question. Um, common European policy or, um, on the national level or NGOs, and then why so late? So, you can, this is a pick and choose, this isn't even a Ming Schengen. <laughs> well, on, on the polarization, because that was directly directed to me. I think the polarization happens for many reasons. I think part of it is the outcome of the economic crisis. It has to do with globalization. Government cannot deliver on their campaign promises anymore because the decisions are out of their hands. It has a lot to do with inequality. It sends that uh, the large parts of the population are losing out. There's little perspective. And it has to be dealt with on all that level. But in many countries, and my own is the clear case, the xenophobia is, uh, the fear of refugees, is probably the most potent instrument by, by these parties uh, to be exploited to get uh, broader traction in, in, in overall society. And therefore, uh, I do think that uh, unless the sense that this process is out of control and these people are coming, this mm. fear, you know, in some parts of Austria, people are starting to buy weapons. This is totally crazy. Uh, but uh, this lack of control, mm. I think, is the most traumatic mm. aspect of the whole thing. And if lots of people are coming in, but this is a somewhat organized process that is handled by, by the institutions, mm. by civil society, etc., in a, in a yeah. overall correct way, these fears will go away. Mm. But the, since in Austria, I think it happened three times in the summer that thousands of refugees just overwhelmed the police and streamed across the border. I think that was the mm -hmm. moment when something in society just mm. broke, mm -hmm. basically. Valentina. Just on that, I, I'm just wondering if this was not also the, the novelty of the phenomenon uh, up until now, last year. I mean, in countries like Croatia, they suddenly, from one day to another, they had thousands of people coming in, and of mm. course people start, you know, had fears of who are all these people. I'm wondering if the politics of fear, in a way, can last, because certainly at one point people will also realize, well, wait a minute, these are people like you and me, you know, why do we have to respond with such a fearful reaction to this? And the more you get to engage, I, the hope is at least, <laughs> the more um, these messages of uh, difference and, and xenophobia will, will also disappear. Or also maybe people will realize th these are not no solutions in the mm. end. Because people come anyway. Carol, why so late? Which, why so late? Why so late? Which you touched on in some ways, but mm. I'd like to hear how, how you say on this. Yeah, thank you for your question. I think it's a, it's a very fair point. Um, because, I mean, if next month it will be five years since the fighting in Syria broke out and, and we could have seen it coming. 
maybe not in this measure, but it could have seemed a bit. Um, and it's a question that, that we ask ourselves as well. For why don't we anticipate more and, and take action mm -hmm. earlier? Um, the European External Action Service, was the, the service working for the High Representative for Foreign and Security Policy for Mrs. Mogherini, is actually setting up a system um, where we have more knowledge, an, an early warning system where we earlier in the track mm -hmm. see what's going to happen. Like when we earlier see like, hey, Burundi is getting out of control or hey, the Central African Republic is getting into trouble and take action. The point is, I think that it's, it's difficult for politicians and publics um, to take the right steps before things happen. And that, that is a difficulty that we have to cope with. And we just have to make sure that, that, that once a thing happens, we act as quickly as we can, that we are prepared, and that hopefully we see things coming in and act mm -hmm. quicker in the future. I, I, I wanted to, to, to yeah. reply quickly to, to the two Hungarian questions. Um, sir, uh, you, you asked about carrot and sticks. I think there is a third thing, which is conviction, to convince your partner. Whenever you're in a negotiating training, mm -hmm. um, what you learn is a policy or a compromise holds not when you force mm -hmm. your partner mm -hmm. into it, but when he is convinced or she is convinced of mm -hmm. that you have to go down that mm -hmm. way. So I'd suggest you get together afterwards and <laughs> you convince each other <laughs> of the way forward. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, I th I, I, in some way, we haven't quite dealt with your answer, but it's, oh, maybe we touched on it. It wasn't a good question. It was just how, how you, yes. Absolutely, it pinches, exactly, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And um, at the layer gap uh, mediation, we have um, where different layers of Europe basically get together mm. and find common solutions. Yes. But in it does work. I think the key communication, um, the key, um, the key to communication is really yes. the key to actually find solutions and achieve objectives. I think um, I think there is a way. Um, well, it's important what you say on this because maybe one of the real one of the big problems of this shocking crisis is the lack of communication. Or, or unilateral decisions, or member states being told what, what to do. Um, another round of questions, please. Um, oh, oh, you know, uh, uh, first of all, this lady over here, uh, and a boy will be number two. Uh, and I, I don't want to miss anybody at the back here. Okay, please, please sit down. Yes. Uh, thank you. I'm uh, Franca von der Laan from the Die Hague Klingendaal Institute. Aha. I was wondering, um, uh, thinking about this uh, early warning system Mrs. Uh, uh, Bogherini is uh, installing, uh, is uh, at any level uh, in the EU, uh, EU um, uh, is anybody dealing with the worst case, with Mr. Lena's worst case scenario? Because we are all putting our balls on, of course, trying uh, to solve the European Union and to realize the best case scenario. Mm. I was wondering, uh, what will the worst case scenario uh, uh, mean for uh, the EU or member states or then maybe <laughs> individual countries to deal with this uh, still existing refugee uh, uh, crisis? Thank you very much. Uh, our, our gentleman from Bruegge, please. Yeah, let me take again. We've forgotten issue, your name again. You have to uh, tell you. Francesco Abadia Thank from Bruegge. <coughs> burden or, or no burden. Uh, I think that it's very important and it came clearly from your intervention, what you tell to the public opinion. And if you tell to the public opinion, you have to make a gift to these people. These people are a burden, you have to show solidarity, you have to make a gift to them. It's a much more difficult than to say you have to make an investment. Hmm. Uh, and, and that is, I think, the right narrative. Uh, of course, you will not win uh, Madame Le Pen, but more reasonable people can understand this kind of reasoning. If you start with the burden, mm. you're a losing argument. Um, this is a very important point mm. before I ask. This is, this is why the established parties must engage people like the parties like Marine, uh, the National Front and other right-wing parties, far right-wing parties. We are demonizing them. Mm. And the more we demonize them, the more we give the supporters the legitimacy that as if we know best. Oh, I mean, that, this, this is, goes back to the whole communication. And I think Carol, you mentioned the conviction. I mean, if you believe in something, you really have to defend it and explain and get out there and explain to the member states. Um, I want to do um, the early warning system. What will, oh yeah, the worst case scenario. We should have left that till the end. <laughs> Well, 
<laughs> the worst case scenario doesn't have to be prepared. That happens by itself <laughs> if we fail <laughs> on uh, dealing with these issues. Uh, I think uh, for me, uh, uh, I think what also needs to be communicated, uh, for me it's just totally implausible that if every single European state tries to close its border, tries to um, handle this issue by itself, by going back to the 1950s, basically, in terms of uh, sovereign uh, exercise of, of power, that the overall result will be acceptable. I think it's blatant. I think millions of people are going to come. Uh, Europe will change mm. tremendously mm. in many positive ways, but also with huge problems. I think both things will be there. But I think it's so evident uh, to everyone who thinks it through that uh, individual steps by Hungary or Austria or Sweden uh, will never produce an overall acceptable result. We cannot go. The, uh, globalization has meant that we cannot go back to the 50s uh, for, for many patent reasons. So in the, in the longer term, the, the case for handling this uh, uh, collectively uh, is, is, I think, totally clear cut. The question is whether we first have to fail really badly mm. before we I finally get the act together. Um, the, your issue of the investment vis-a-vis uh, -vis the burden, I mean, this is, this is a crucial selling point, I suppose. But on the other hand, it feeds into Steffen's um, description that the, this refugee, it's not a crisis, the refugee era is here to stay in some ways. And we haven't even yet seen the impact of climate change on the Sahel. Um, uh, Valentino, you want to come in here? No. Yeah. no? Um, I would, I would like to, nobody's mentioned um, in any way um, the role of Angela Merkel. And it would be very interesting if anybody's any questions or want to raise whether her unilateral decision was wise or whether um, there's now such a feeling of backlash against her. I mean, the, the big question is why, or the big question is the Vichy grad countries and other countries sort of now, um, how would you say, getting their own back in Germany because it led over the Ukraine crisis and Russia and Euro crisis. And so Merkel got the solidarity for all of this. But when it comes to the refugee issue, because she welcomed the refugees, the other country said, well, you know, sorry, this is your problem now. And she isn't getting the solidarity um, she expected. I mean, isn't this terribly damaging for the whole idea of, of, of the solidarity ethos of, of the EU? I mean, this was, this is, one of the bedrocks of, of the EU? Well, you know, you had this alliance of the willing of about 11 countries that had a whole series of meetings, sometimes also with Turkey. Uh, and uh, I think now it's called the alliance of the unwilling, basically, yes. because uh, Mrs. Merkel lost one ally after the other, basically. Uh, Swedes introduced the border controls, then Austria is now doing its own Balkan strategy. Uh, so. And unfortunately, uh, as a European leader, uh, you need followers. And at yes. the moment, uh, I think the, the problem is that Merkel doesn't have followers. And unfortunately, and for me, that is very frustrating, is that the European institutions that are supposed to be uh, the givers of impulses, the leaders, etc., are really failing on this issue. It's not surprising to some extent because uh, in the area of home affairs and justice, uh, most of the competences are still with the member states and there is uh, not enough of a, a mm. firm a key and the commission is not as strong as it is on trade policy. But uh, I think it was probably always a wrong idea that, that this could be managed uh, under a German lead, uh, mm. even without the French support, basically. Mm. That would never happen. And what we've seen over the months is that Germany has become weaker and weaker on this issue, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Carola, just, yes, just please. Just very briefly to add to that, I would not want to, to over-dramatize um, what is said about Mrs. Merkel. There is, from the European Council, where she participates, a clear agreement on what we're going to do, and she has regional elections soon. So she's under attack because it's almost elections. And I think that's part of the explanation why the attack is so strong, that this is an election debate. And then hopefully um, the debate will lead to, to, to an election result. And then afterwards, you mean it will be better after the election? It's part of the, the discourse in Germany that you would normally have in, in the run-up to elections. 
Well, it wasn't, it wasn't really getting at that. I mean, she's, she's beleaguered by her own party and the Christian Social Union. But I was actually getting how, how the member states uh, see her and how they've um, criticised her and how they have, um, in some ways, demonised her. There's been pretty nasty caricatures coming out of, of the Polish press. And remember how the Hungarian press has been covering um, Germany and Merkel uh, particularly. Remember the Greek press, how they covered Merkel and Schäuble during the Euro crisis. But there is this, there is this, it's not even residual, there's this open, open resentment now of, of mm. Merkel. It's not the Germans, it's, that's my impression, living in Berlin, and I, I see that Mrs. Merkel is more and more beleaguered and essentially alone at the top. Um, I don't know if this is the impression of anybody here, but it's, it's not a particularly uh, pleasant situation, particularly since Germany supported uh, EU enlargement for the Visegrad countries and all the other countries in the region, and now she's getting very, there's, there's some sort of payback time. It's, it's very strange. Well, uh, if I break very yes. briefly, I think the German hegemonic moment happened during the Euro crisis, when it was the mm. ultimate sort of backstop and guarantor of the Euro surviving. But this was always a bad system. It created a lot of uh, uh, anger and frustration in some of the uh, yes. southern countries, yes. the debtor countries. Uh, it, weakened the institutions. Uh, I, I think it probably damaged the German-French uh, relationship too. And it's not normal for Europe to be led by, by one country. And at the beginning of the refugee crisis, this sort of carried yes. over because she has established herself as such a strong leader in the European Council. But as I said, because of the kind of asymmetric mm -hmm. uh, situation that now Germany asked for solidarity rather than offering it, uh, she was much weaker in, in getting everyone to follow these lines. Uh, but I, I do firmly believe that this is, uh, Germany will not solve this crisis. Right. Uh, it, right. We have to have a mm. stronger group uh, of countries. Uh, yeah. We have to revive the German-French relationship yes, absolutely. Uh, before, uh, to develop uh, sustainable solutions. It but cannot be left to, to one Yes, place. but that's and not until 2017. Yeah. And if I may add, the, yes, the, the European Commission, who should be the proponent of, of all these ideas on how to, to solve various issues, in, including the migration crisis, and the Commission has been strongly German led, influenced, uh, I mean, I don't think Ms. Merkel could have wished for a stronger ally than, than Mr. Juncker, but unfortunately, he has not exactly. gathered the, exactly. the support of the others. And then the question is, shouldn't the commission also come up with its own ideas, yes. maybe, that are not so uh, German or and, and no offense to a Polish colleague, I mean, um, that, uh, uh, put, put, um, I mean, two, are you British? Oh, that's, oh, no, you're, not, you're British. <laughs> all of them, <laughs> all of them. <laughs> Brexit and right. Polish. Yeah, you're French, that's okay too. <laughs> Let me get off it. But um, uh, about um, the Polish, yes, and we have a problem with Donald Tusk as well. I mean, Merkel and himself got on very well and then Tusk did um, a 180 degrees uh, yeah. turn. I mean, it's been very, very difficult. But this is what power and politics is unfortunately about. The, you, you, quick intervention, very quickly, quickly. And then we're going to wrap it up. Uh, no, but about Merkel and yes. the refugees. You want uh, to support her? Yeah. Uh, Good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, come on. Uh, 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 during, uh, I think it was six months yes. ago, uh, many economic responsibles in Germany, they said that uh, they need six million yes. uh, uh, refugees. Yes. And uh, Mrs. Malmström, when she was uh, commissioner uh, yeah. on uh, uh, internal affairs, she said in SEPS, yeah, yeah. the other side, that... Uh, we need in Europe 20 million uh, persons, yeah. workers, yeah. during the next 20 yeah. years. Well, we've touched you on... Know, the, the, the it's all about it, Zink. Well, it goes back to our Hungarian question. Um, we've touched on all the burdens and the investments. <laughs> we still haven't resolved the problem of implementation. This has been a very, very lively discussion. I want to thank uh, particularly Karola van Rinsko for, for taking for coming here and, and, and having to give, not having to give, willing to give a Dutch, um, the Dutch presentation. Valentina Pop, I know you have to go, you're rushing back. Thank you very, very much Thanks. for coming. And Stefan Lehne, who gave a, a fantastically succinct, succinct presentation of a highly complex issue. His paper is there for, or you can down, download it on the website. Thank you very much, and a great audience. Oh, and there's food behind the screen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.